everybody can see me and my pens. Give it a minute here. Some people get in here. I'm going to wait till about 45 seconds and then I'm going to start talking, ladies and gentlemen. Chance to come in here. My notes to reflect. seconds. Hey everybody, the cameraman here. Well, today is Friday, May 13th. It's Friday the 13th. Um, for those who are superstitious, but today it is the day that finally, in the matter of People versus Richard Al, 19 CF 05320, uh, Butte County Superior Court number, um, we have finally reached jury deliberations in this 30-year-old, um, well, in November of this year, 31-year-old um, gold case. Uh, for those who are unaware, uh, Mr. Richard Allen Pyle, the defendant in this case, is charged with murder of a woman by the name of Zanstra all the way back in November of 1991. Now the alleged act that he committed is that not only did he murder this woman, but he dismembered her and then disposed of her body, which has never been found. Uh, to my knowledge, it still has not been found, and uh, it's not confirmed whether or not she is actually dead or is still a missing person because of the fact that, well, no body has ever been found. But here at the Butte County Superior Court, the people, that being the district attorney's office, feels that they have met their burden of proof to charge Mr. Pyle with the crime of murder against the, the victim, Tracy Zanstra. Um, his counsel, uh, Mrs. Latimer and Mr. Sears, feel different, and I believe they put on quite a good uh, defense, a fair defense, I should say, um, in regards to disproving that claim um, by the Butte County District Attorney uh, that Mr. Pyle is guilty of these alleged actions and we are on currently right now verdict watch as to whether or not he'll be found not guilty or guilty. Um, we should know by 4.30 today uh, if we are going to come back Monday to continue deliberations or if the jury would potentially be able to come back and deliver a verdict before 5 o'clock today. So I have some time to kill um, at the courthouse until uh, said time comes around where we will know whether or not the jury will have a decision today or will be coming back Monday. Ladies and gentlemen, my biggest hope right now is that, well, for one, this trial has been nine days. This is the ninth day of this projected 12-day trial, so it's going uh, faster than projected. Uh, I don't like today being Friday. Now you may be asking, well, why? Isn't Friday normally a good day? Well, yeah, it's the start of the week, and I like Friday. But not so much in this regard, because juries don't like Fridays. And I've had it where other cases where the judge specifically said, if you don't come back with a verdict today, we're going to have to come back Monday. But this is a case that the Monday was already pre-planned for jury deliberation. I'm just hoping the jury does not get in their head, hey, guys, if we get a verdict today, we don't have to come back Monday and next week. So I'm hoping they will take their time. And just because of the sheer fact of the everything in this case, you're going to have to take time. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, there's over 300 jury instructions in this case. So uh, 12 people will actually, well, no, no. I don't think we have quite 12 people because the alternates, the alternates, they went to go home. But I think we have quite, we, yeah, we do have 12 people, four, four alternates. Um, the alternates went home, so they, you know, they, they're on call. But we got 12 people that have to w read over 300 instructions. That's going to at least take an hour, right? I mean, you know, if we hope they read them anyways, uh, they should read them. Um, so... We will, we will see uh, if there's a verdict or not. I don't expect there to be one, just because of the fact of the amount of stuff to go over. Most likely we will be coming back tomorrow. I mean, not tomorrow, tomorrow's Saturday. Uh, coming back on Monday. But uh, I'm going to do a live stream now to update and talk about, you know, I will be doing eventually a more in-depth video, probably multiple parts, because this is a long trial. Um, but briefly,
briefly, I just wanted to go over some of my notes that I've been documenting the past nine on and off days with this trial. And I say on and off days is because, well, this, this trial uh, hasn't been, you know, Monday through Friday. For the past three weeks, it's been Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Friday. And then this last upcoming week that they have is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, which they set aside for jury deliberations. Whether it takes all the way into next Wednesday, I don't know. But we're only on Friday. So it hasn't been, you know, a consistent, you know, so if, there, if you have an idea that jury trials are always Monday through Friday back to back, well, that's not always the case. And it's not the case in this trial. So throughout that course, um, I've been taking notes. I wanted to start with the first two days, which will be somewhat brief. The first two days were just mainly picking a jury itself. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it took two days to pick a jury out of the, you know, so jury selection... I think was one of the most strenuous parts of this trial as you, we have to pull in and question individual people. It takes a long period of time. And uh, nothing too notable. I, want, I mean, I will, like I said, ladies and gentlemen, go in more in depth when I have more time to go deeply into these notes that I've been collecting. But just the main points I wanted to bring up in jury selection was um, I don't know, per say particularly, it's just Butte County and the fact that it's a smaller county than most. But one thing I felt kind of surprising is that the majority of people that they brought in for jury selection, when they asked the question, well, do you know somebody in law enforcement, they either had a relative of law enforcement somewhere here in the state of California, or actually knew somebody directly um, involved with law enforcement here in Butte County. I mean, hell, one of the jurors that they polled, who was ultimately, you know, dismissed, they didn't want him, uh, he's a dispatcher for the Butte County Sheriff's Department. Now, I know everybody, you know, is subject to jury duty in this state. Last time I checked, if you're registered to vote and have a driver's license in this state, don't quote me on that, because rules for being registered voters varies from state to state. But I do believe in the state of California, not only to register to vote, I mean, I mean, jury, I'm, I'm speaking to myself, ladies and gentlemen, for jury duty, you have to be registered to vote and have a driver's license. But that, that might not be the same for every state. You may just have to be registered to vote. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're mainly talking about people that were selected. So whether it was just chance of luck, but it's like one lady, she knew somebody in the district attorney's office. The gentleman I was just spoken about, dispatcher of the sheriff's department, knows two of the detectives that are going to be testifying in this case. And they're asking him, well, do you think you can be unbiased? And he's like, well, my job as a dispatcher is to log everything and record it. And if some deputy doesn't like it, well, you know, that's their problem. I'm not here to lie. And I'm just kind of going myself, hmm, you know, this guy, you know, he's making a decent statement. But what's not being asked here is, Okay, well, do you know if you testify in this jury, uh, are you going to be sub? Do you know that you could be potentially subjugated to harassment from your fellow court workers due to what you potentially may or may not do on this trial? You know, now I don't know if that's an appropriate question to ask because you can't ask certain questions when pulling these jurors. But you know, it's like you're going to be on a jury, essentially going against all your buddies. It's like, you know. One of the questions brought up was, well, do you interact with any of these people outside of work? And he's, no. And, okay, that's fine. You know, I, I don't think you have to, in my opinion anyways, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you may say different, but I don't think necessarily you have to hang out with somebody outside of work to be good friends with them. But uh, that's one of the questions was, you know, do you associate with these people outside of work or are you just co-workers? But, you know, it's like when you work with somebody for X amount of years, you know, just because you guys don't hang out outside the job doesn't mean you can't develop, you know, bonds and relationships. But it's just the fact that, like, how did this guy even get on here? It's like, and because it's like, before you even get into the courtroom, ladies and gentlemen, you have to fill out questionnaires and all this paperwork to even get this far. And it's like, like this should have been like one of the questions on the paperwork. 
do you, are you friends or family with anybody in law enforcement? Like, but I don't know how they do things. But then again, ladies and gentlemen, they do things differently here in Butte County. So what am I saying? I do know what they do here at Butte County. Things differently than any other county. Um, so it's just, it was kind of surprising just to see how many people were in either knew somebody in law enforcement or knew somebody directly with government connections here in Butte County. So it's just, it's just that was something odd or quite a coincidence. But when it comes to Butte County, ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, there's no such things as coincidences with these people. Um, day two, more jury selection. Day three is when we actually got to um, opening arguments. And basically, the people's, you know, they were very short in their opening argument. There basically was, well, he's guilty, you must find him guilty, thank you, bye. Pretty much, ladies and gentlemen. But whereas the defense, um, I believe here, my page here. Oh no, no, day three. I'm getting my head on myself. Day day four was actually the opening arguments. Day three, I skipped over day three here, ladies and gentlemen, because it's just it was just um, motions and limni, just basically confirming things that they were going to add, not allow. Nothing really relevant off the top of my head as to um, any any objections or motions. I know I'll be in more detail, but nothing prudent that uh, strike my mind. Oh, other than, oh, actually, that the, that hearing was two, uh, two and a half hours with no break. Judge Deems, you know, he was, he was determined getting it done, so that was a two and a half hour hearing with no break. So that was quite a, quite a pee holder, if you know what I mean, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but now, actually, on the day four was the um, opening arguments. Um, like I said, the people were uh, very, very short in their opening argument of just, you know, he, he's guilty, you must find him guilty, thank you, bye. Whereas um, the defense, I believe it was um, this uh, Miss Latimer, that, uh, which is on this case, Mr. Pyle, the defendant, he has his public defender who has been on here for quite a while, Mr. Kevin Sears. Me and him have had some not agreeable opinions of one another, but I will say this, ladies and gentlemen, he's not a Robert Marshall. I mean, they, from what Mr. Marshall told me, they talk, but, you know, Mr. Sears, if he's watching this, you know, you've never played baby games in the hallway with me. You never did this to me as we walked past each other in the hallway. You never made remarks as we, you know, you, 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 you know, we, ex we co we're some able to coexist, you know, we may disagree, you know, I, Bill, I tried to reach out at the very beginning in good faith, but hey, you know, you never told me to, or suggest in any way I should kill myself, so, you know, I know you called me an idiot, and your defendant says, you know, you say I'm fucking crazy, you know, that's from your defendant, I mean, you know, the defendant that you represent telling me this, that you told him, you said that's attorney-client privilege, so whether or not that's true, you know, that's your opinion, you know, and I can't really argue with that too much because, you know, I do kind of some things that aren't the norm, but, you know, I have a different modus of operandi than some other people. But that's what makes us beautiful and different in this world, ladies and gentlemen, is our own unique features. But, uh, you know, he's, you know, we have different opinions, but, you know, he's, uh, doesn't play games and, you know, you know, uh, I mean, I can't really say much other than that. He doesn't play games, you know. And he's not, you know, some, you know, I don't personally hate him, and I hope he doesn't personally hate me. But, I mean, after this case, I can, I can say definitely he puts on a good argument. Um, it's just kind of weird. It takes three years to get there and some, you know, disagreement in between about identity issues. But, uh, you know, I think he made some pretty valid points during this case. But uh, I believe it was, like I said... Mrs. Latimer, which Mr. Sears brought in as co-counsel to assist him in this matter, uh, I believe she did the opening argument, which, you know, she took a good chunk of time up. Ah, thank you, real, uh, Neely, Neely, thank you, and hello, News Now Fresno, hello, Time to Stand. I see you got some comments in here, but I appreciate you all listening to what I have to say. Um, 
So she made, you know, and they took, the defense took a good, good chunk of time, you know, close to, I think, 30 minutes doing this opening argument. And then when the people did theirs, again, because the people, because they have the burden of proof, they get to do the opening argument and the closing opening argument. And then closing argument, they get to do the opening closing, and then the defense goes, and then they get to do the closing closing, if you will, um, because they have the burden of proof in this matter. So then they did theirs, you know, wrapped up essentially short, just, oh, she said this, but we, we think he's guilty, find him guilty, thank you, bye. Uh, then they called uh, their first witness, a detective, um, George Mahon of the Butte County Sheriff's Department. Look, with an argument may explain why. Yes, that is true. Um, no, not me. This is not. This is not for my case. This is for Defendant Richard Howard Pyle, and I think he's. I know murder is like a thirty-year to twenty-five-year sentence, but I think this one he might be facing life. I'm not entirely sure. You know, we haven't gotten far to sentencing yet. We got to be guilty before we can even get sentenced to a time or what. So, Detective George Mahon of the Butte County uh, Sheriff's Department. He was the first detective on this case, and you know. Like uh, the words of Kevin Sears, I have to agree with him that, you know, I think he investigated this case thoroughly when it was as freshest, and that was back in 1991. So, you know, he did, and that, based on the limited resources of what was available at 91, you know, they still had luminol. You know, this guy gets on the stand and testifies that he went in there with a five-man team for seven hours, and they can't they couldn't find any evidence of a crime with luminol and black lights and he, if I recall, he did testify to the fact that he did take some photographs on some uh, millimeter film but I guess those photos failed were the words. I don't know if they didn't develop right or the film got damaged but we didn't have those photos because technology fails, you know, and I can understand that. I, you know, sometimes my body camera uh, you know, I didn't let it boot up enough time and hit the record button thought I record, or sometimes I've had it where it, uh, you know, didn't think the memory card was in, and it recorded, but didn't save anything, because it had nothing, to, nowhere to save it to. So, I understand that technology fails, you know, that's understandable, but it's like, this is a, this is a dismemberment case. You should have gone back and retaken photographs. Hey, Oklahoma Community Watch, thanks for tuning in. But, you know, there's no photographs, but, you know, photographs, you know, you know, a picture does tell a thousand words, so that's for sure. But mainly the fact that there's luminol and nothing was found with the luminol, including the drain traps. And, you know, now I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, ladies and gentlemen, because now I'm talking about some of the defense expert testimony. They did bring in a defense ex a forensic expert and... I just had to laugh at this, ladies and gentlemen. The, the, the people, the DA, one of the questions they asked, which I don't think is completely unreasonable, but it's still kind of a little silly if you know, if you know a basic, basic knowledge of plumbing. Um, she asked, well, would you agree that uh, all drains have traps? And I'm like, well, they better if you don't want sewer gas flowing back into your house. So, you know, that was a little funny there, but, like, they found no blood in the drain. You know, and from my knowledge of my study and investigation into this case, the alleged house where this dismemberment occurred, that drain, everything drains to a septic tank. So why not go and pull the septic tank for any bone fragments or things of that nature? But uh, that was never done, but nor was that ever brought up in court. That's just something I know uh, from what I've gathered in my research and what I've been told from the defendant himself because I've gone and spoke to the defendant in jail to get his side of the story you know, over the past you know, couple of years of investigating this case. Um, so, day four, we had Mr. Um, Mahon testify. Then, um, you know, and talk about the, uh, the alleged victim, Mrs. Uh, Tracy Zanstra. You know, and her, whether, you know, I'm not going to get in too much about her treatment of her children because I'm not really here for that. You know, that's, 
you know, opinion of how is this, how really gloomy is this dismemberment? P-trap or sink, you choose. Yeah, right, a P-trap, but um, into uh, the dismemberment comment there, uh, this is dismemberment as in taking, well, ladies and gentlemen, there's, they're alleging he used a chainsaw to cut her up. It's also alleged he used a circular skill saw to cut her up. It's alleged that he used a sawzaw to cut her up. And it's even alleged that he used a freaking, you know, like a Looney Tunes hand-powered saw to cut her up. And I'm like, okay, the skill saw, the chainsaw, maybe, but are we really going to sit here and believe that somebody with a hand-powered saw is cutting through someone's human flesh and bones? You know how many hours that's going to take? And I don't even think quite, ladies and gentlemen, there's enough power there to cut through human bone. But I don't dismember people, so how should I know? <laughs> um, so, that answers that question, if you're wondering. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's quiet, true. But then again, you're out in the middle of mountain wilderness in a town of 100 people surrounded by wood. So, what worry is there or noise to begin with when your neighbor is like, your next neighbor lives five miles away? Um, check my battery here, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to draw. Oh, we're at almost 20%, so I better, I better keep going. We're only, we got five more days to get through here. Start chainsaw at three. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, because nobody really chainsaw. But I guess they're alleging, you know, it, it happened between, you know, between 6, 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. from their timeline, you know, so it happened in the, the late hours of the night, if you will. So, there's some of that. Um, but I was saying, uh, as there's some allegations in Mr. Detective Mahon's report in regards to this is not the first time that Tracy, the alleged victim in this case, has ever allegedly ran off. Um, there's some allegations that she's not the greatest mother to her children, some other things, and that the alternative theory here lays in, because that's one of the attorney's jobs that's representing the client, is present alternative theories that don't involve your client. And one of those is that potentially, you know, she ran off again to start a new identity and left her children, because this is not the first time that it's been reported that she has run off without her kids before. So there's some things to that. Um, I'm going to start because of battery. I'm going to start talking about some of the more damaging testimony. I mean, Mr. Mahon was the least, I think, damaging uh, testimony that was heard in this case. Um, let's talk about day four here. We're going to talk to a talk about a Mrs. Where is it here? Uh, Mrs. Uh, Jennifer Nap Napoli, I believe that I'm pronouncing that correctly, is, okay, this is the people's evidence here, is that alleged, this alleged hair clomp that has some scalp, and when I say scalp, they say, like, hair, like skin from your, the scalp of your head, not actually like a chunk of your scalp. That's alleging where they came from, but all I see is hair that in no way, shape, or form tells me if it was from an armpit, a head, a pubic area, or where it was from. All it is is, is this, this hair that supposedly has blood all over it and whatnot. And yet, a whole team of five detectives from the Butte County Sheriff's Department couldn't figure this out, but this one friend of the defendant and the alleged victim, as in her own words, came over there to be nosy, uh, was able to find this hair after five days of going over there in a row. And now she testifies that after finding this hair, she put it in her pocket and took it home with her and showed it to her mom to find out what to do and then showed it, showed it to her friend and then they took it to a, 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 um, a sheriff's deputy at a gas station in Sterling City and handed it off. Just, just this horrible chain of evidence. So there's that, ladies and gentlemen. And then the next day... Because, let me see, we had, who did we have after Mr. Coley? 
come and testify. We had, um, oh, I'm getting out of order here. Well, it doesn't really matter too much. This is after, you know, well, actually, we'll save, we'll save, we'll save some of this for the more in-depth video. Here, I'm going to talk about one witness, but I'm going to be here just, just explaining to understand this one witness's testimony. Uh, we're going to be here like half an hour. I don't want to, I'm, and I'm almost already half an hour, and I want to keep this under 30 minutes. So I might save Mr. Zanstra, the, the, the father-in-law of the alleged victim, for the in-depth video. But basically, there's a theory here that this father-in-law killed his own daughter-in-law to basically steal a $20,000 sum of money that she was entitled to a share of through the proceeds of a house. So that's one alternative theory. But I'm mainly sticking with the evidence used, being used against Mr. Pyle right now, since that's what the jury is. But again, these statements, as stated by the judge, these witness statements are evidence. Exactly, exactly. It, it just doesn't make sense. Five ex experts, I will get that to the end here when I close out, ladies and gentlemen, what I believe in my study of this case. Um, you know, this woman comes and then, come next day, day five here, ladies and gentlemen, another gentleman by the name of, um, you know, and there's a couple of friends that talk here, but I'm going to get to this here um one because the thing is you know back in the 90s this sort of house was like a party house where these young 17 18 year old 20 year olds would come over do their illicit activities you know it's a party house ladies and gentlemen so not really a house where children should be growing up but one of these party growers uh mr jimmy rashka if i'm saying that correctly um he comes over there to be, you know, to, as in his words, to, to snoop around because he heard, you know, the alleged victim disappeared. And so he tells the story of this hair being found. Of Actually, this Jennifer Napoli, she found the hair. She called um, him in because they were at, there. they were, you know, they were all came over to be nosy together. And then this one other girl and called them all into the same room and showed them the hair, stretched it out and washed it, got it damp to, you know, stretch it out, and then took it and put it in a plastic bag and put it in her pocket, and then they went and met this deputy to, at a um, gas station for the handoff. So you got one lady saying she, she was the only one that found the hair, and she didn't show anybody until she showed her mom when he got home, and then you got a completely other guy up here saying... Oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, uh, she showed me the hair. She showed everybody the hair. So which one is it? That's that somebody is obviously lying there. Because, you know, it's like, ladies and gentlemen, if I was at your house and um, there's two people, you and person, let's say person B, and I'm person C, I lose my wallet, okay? And uh, person A finds my wallet. But then person A comes and says he found my wallet. Well, I only have one wallet, and there's two people. So either one of you found my wallet and, and has it, or one of you is lying about having my wallet and doesn't have it. Because it cannot be found by two people, you know, in the same place. So either he found it or she found it. So there's just so... And regardless of who found it, this whole chain of custody of it being delivered into the sheriff's department's custody by this handoff at a gas station and then taken, this deputy didn't bother to book it into evidence until seven hours later. I think he went, if I remember correctly, he went home and it, it sat in his car for who knows how long or if it even sat in his car. We don't know if he took it or did anything with it or what. So there's just horrible, horrible chain of custody in this. Hey, Nasty Nathaniel, thanks for tuning in. Um, another statement I want to bring up is, I believe it was this Mr. Jimmy Rashka or another friend. I have to go, you know, I'm just, I'm just skimming through my notes here to tell some, you know, just some of this stuff here. Because this, like I said, ladies, you know, this is probably going to be a couple of parts and a couple hours long. Um, 
of, you know, reporting on this case and putting it into a YouTube video format. Uh, but, you know, another one of these, you know, alleged friends of, that went over to party, you know, uh, if it's this Mr. I got, I got so many people testifying. This, uh, like I said, this Jimmy Rashka, or um, had a gentleman before that. Come on, notes, quick phone. Rashka and a a, ja, a Mr. Josh Ship. Now, oh great, we're we're losing. Oh shit, I'm freezing up. I'm getting overheated and I'm losing some batteries, so I better hurry up, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me. With the little emoji, I'm gonna keep talking. My screen kind of froze in that position as it is. Um, but either Mr. Rashka or Mr. Ship, um, they testified when they went over to the defendant's house, they only saw two pairs of shoes um, to the alleged victim. And one of them, either Mr. Rashka or Mr. Ship, I have to go through my notes in a little more detail, they specifically said, oh, she only has two pairs of shoes to her name. Now, I don't have a lot of lady friends, but I know women, and the fact that a man a man would ironclad himself with a statement such as, she only has two pairs of shoes to her name. Just sounded so odd to me. Because it's just, I've never heard of that before. You know, and then the next day, the, uh, well, this would be on a Tuesday, so the Friday, the Friday, they called in the alleged victim's daughter, uh, Nicole Zanstra, or um, she's got a, a new married name now, but in this regard, I'm referring to her maiden name, if you will. Um, she was asked the question of, well, did you pay attention to your mom's jewelry and what kind of shoes? And she stated that she had so many shoes she couldn't count. So you got a man saying this woman only had two pairs of shoes to her name, which is such a, such a specific statement. But then you have the victim's own daughter saying, well, she had so many shoes I couldn't count. So that's just odd. I think that's very odd. And uh, we had some back and forth with the detectives recalling them regarding um, things that were said and whether or not they were true and whatnot. Um, one, the main two things I'm going to end, uh, well, speak of this, and then my, well, my thoughts on the matter, because I have 12% of battery. I'm glad I brought my charger with me today, ladies and gentlemen. Um, is that one of the big factors in this case is the alleged victim's son, Mr. Robert Zanstra. Now, Mr. Robert Zanstra testified in the preliminary hearing of this matter, and he was expected to testify... Um, in this trial, but at the beginning of April 2022, this year, he was unfortunately murdered in Marysville, California. It has not been proven yet as whether or not it is in relation to this case. Thank you for the thumbs up. Um, let me know I'm still being heard. Um, if it had anything to do with this case, but at the beginning of April, he was approached by a man, as I was told from speaking to his wife, just walked up, shouted something along the lines of, Hey, Robert, and shot him six times at a close range. And his wife stated she is an emergency technician, and there was nothing that not even she could do for him. And uh, it's very unfortunate that... Uh, you know, this happened to this man because he's obviously had a disturbed life from what I'm about to tell you in regards to his testimony. Uh, I can't be too long because I now you know, run out of battery here, ladies and gentlemen, but to really try and sum this gentleman up, um, he didn't have the greatest of childhood. He 
you know, I think his mother loved him, but, you know, there's some allegations in this case whether or not the night in question his mother disappeared as to him stealing a 12-pack of beer at uh, 12 years old and some marijuana and smoking it. Uh, but then again, this is a house where meth was openly dealt and done. So, I mean, it is possible. But, uh, you know, he's had some trouble and uh, throughout his adult life because of what his childhood, I'll speak about here in a moment, has caused. You know, he's been out of jail, struggling with drug addiction and possibly some mental mental um, trauma there, but but the def the uh, the district attorney is alleging that uh, the defendant got this 12-year-old boy to participate in his own mom's dismemberment. And I, I'm very skeptical about that. I mean, it's very possible that he could have been out of fear and contributed, you know, to protect himself and his sister as he stayed in the preliminary hearing, but the fact that he was never charged um, is kind of odd, but he was the most cru one of the most crucial t people to testify as saying, you know, he chopped up his mother with the defendant. Um, you know, he's, he's, there's obviously, you know, whether or not that's true, I mean, He's no longer with us, and only he can know himself better than anybody in this world. Um, if it is true, that's heartbreaking, tragic, uh, and disturbing. But if it's not true, why would you lie about somebody like that, you know, and say you help dismember your own mother? I mean, there's just so many things in this case, ladies and gentlemen, that add up. And one thing is, um, see if I can fix the screen here to show it. See if it'll turn around. I'm about to end with my concluding thoughts. I wanted to show a document here, my hands. But, uh, did it on? Okay. See, we got this, this here it says, ex parte, um, Discovery. Now, I can't get too much into this, but filed it today. Well, I shouldn't say filed. They said I'm not a party, but they received stamped it. I was given some information confidentially that I don't have to reveal um, through my source. You know, it's my sources. You know, I have a protected right under the California Constitution in regards to this case. That wasn't addressed in court. So whether or not that will ever be addressed, I do not know. But to uh, conclude, ladies and gentlemen, because I met my about 30 minute mark, I went out over about eight more minutes than I wanted to. Um, in regards to the commenter, because I'm gonna go a little bit more detail into this uh, when I have time to sit down and do some proper narration, present some photographs and scan documents and things, um, is that I do not believe that the people, being the Butte County District Attorney's Office, has met their burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. There's too many inconsistencies, there are too many lies. I mean, the, Mr. Sears uh, deliberately said, you know, said these people on the stand lied to the jury. And the, the instructions are. Judging said, if somebody lied, you should not consider anything they said to be true. So, I do not believe that, and I've only given a basic little bit of testimony. There's, you know, well over, you know, basically going from court 8.30 to 4.30 every day for the past nine days. Well, there's well over at least maybe close to not 30 hours of, you know, people talking that I've comprised in the notes here. Uh, so it's like, I've just only mentioned a fraction, but, you know, ladies and gentlemen, let me know. Do you think just based on what I mentioned briefly, you know, and if you want to consider it close to 40 minutes brief, um, proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. Um, but, uh, I appreciate y'all tuning in and watching. 
Um, I'm going to go over the comments real quick. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh yes, thank you Nasty Nathaniel for the handsome comment. I do get lots of comments about my sharp dressed man appearance at the courthouse. Ah, greetings from Stockholm, Sweden. Nice. I'm not sure. He might have been. He has a long rap sheet. Uh, Neil A. Proof of that. Girl, the daughter, and her boyfriend went to... Her. Oh, no, 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 this isn't... I don't know this is, but no, this is not about an Aruban vacation nightmare or anything like that. It's about the law, and you're willing to count. Oh, thank you, noble... noble... Sh oh, that's right, noble shit. Noble... Sheet, sheet, sheet. There's no I like that. It's been a while since I've seen you around. But yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, you know, we need more people out here willing to challenge the law. That's what America and free speech, you know, is really all about. Being able to challenge things that we don't agree with. But, um... Thank you for coming in. I see my face has been frozen up close. Uh, not my most pleasurable of looks, but, uh... Thank, thanks again for tuning in. Um, let me know your thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I hope uh, if I if you don't see me uh, with another live stream, it's 3.30 now as I'm about to end this Pacific Standard Time. Um, if you don't hear from me by, well, let's say 5 o'clock with another live stream as to a, um, a verdict, uh, you'll probably not hear sometime next week, either Monday or Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, depending on how long deliberations go. But uh, at the very least, I will check in Monday, letting you know that deliberations are still continuing or if we have a verdict. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this is the cameraman reporting from the Butte County Superior Courthouse here in Oroville, signing off.